in this video, we're going to move the E point. Remember, I've placed the E point one, the omnidirectional E point one, on on the window suckers on the window, and I want you to notice that the residence, the 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 rest of the residence is behind the antenna, so to speak, of the E point one omnidirectional antenna. So now we're going to move it on to the mast. It's about four and a half meters off the previous position, which is about 14 uh, foot seven inches thereabouts. And watch closely when we look at the results, what, what happens when an omnidirectional antenna has a shield, so to speak, on the one side, and it's moved into an open environment. Now, just to give you a hint, the azimuth of the antenna, so to speak, the zero degrees is just about due north, and the base station is about 15 degrees. And you'll see when I look at the E.2, the directional antenna, that I'm going to orient it in that direction. Now, towards the south, in other words, the back end of the antenna, and to the west, 270 degrees, there's a number of base stations, but they're quite a distance away. The base station that we're communicating with, my primary base station, is about 370 odd meters, 15 degrees. And in the next video, I'll explain why, because of the topography, the signal is not as good as it could be due to some residences on the hill and some vegetation. So let's, uh, let's do it. Without further ado, let's go and move the antenna. This is the lab over here. And what we're going to do is we're going to go outside and I'm going to show you where the E point is. That's the E point one. The E point one is currently installed on the window there. And what we're going to do is we're going to move it up to the mast there. So here we are. I've just taken the E.1 off of the window there. You'll still be able to see the suckers. They're still stuck on the window. The E.1 just slides off. Um, these, this is where the, the pipe clamp is going to fit around. So we're going to put the uh, pipe clamp around here. And then that's going to go around the mast that we have over here. Right, so so here we have the the pipe clamps. The pipe clamps are in on position, and the the next thing is get it up on the mast. Safety first. So now you can see that I've actually installed it in the same orientation as it was on the window. So that we are only going to look at the actual height differential and what the height differential is going to do in terms of an improved signal. Right. There we are. Installation done. Just another quick clip to show you a close up of the antenna. And then as we zoom back, you can see where the antenna was stuck on the window. There's the window sucker still stuck on the window. Right, so so yeah, we are. Uh, we're back here for um for the test with the uh, E point one up on the mast. And you'll see when I, when I do the insert now that we have a noise issue at our premises here. You will see when I publish the results for you that an omnidirectional antenna high up on the mast is picking up more noise. I am battling, so to speak, 
to get the noise level down. Now, this is a perfect example where we want to maybe look at a directional antenna because my topography is such that I've got a single tower, a single E node B that is the possible candidate for me to get a good signal from. Now, when I publish the results, you will see that on the mast, I'm actually battling to get a good signal to interference and noise ratio. And that typically is significant of an area where there's a lot of radio noise, a lot of in-channel radio noise, because you will see that my RSRP is not bad. My signal strength um, is 51, but the important one, RSRP, is uh, 83 dBm, and you'll see that on the results. However, my RSRQ, and remember I said don't shy away from RSRQ, RSRQ is showing me that it is dropped to minus 17 dB. And we can see that because the signal to noise, uh, to interference and noise ratio, I'm battling to get that at around about 5.1 dB, which is not a good uh, signal to interference and noise ratio. So, so summarizing the results, as I've said, signal strength came in at minus 53 dBm, the RSRP at minus 87, and then RSRQ worsened to minus 17 dB and signal to interference and noise at 5.1 dB. That's not a very good noise figure. And we can see the results when we look at the actual degradation of the upload. The upload degrad uh, degraded by 58%. The improvement on the downlink was only 5.24%. And then if we look at the radio frequency improvement, the yes, the RSRP improved by 9 dB, and, and that is substantial. But look at now our RSRQ degraded, degraded by 6 dB. And remember the the blocks that are that I've shown you as far as RSRP is concerned, that is very representative of the power and then the RSRQ calculation from the that takes the uh, RSSI, the received signal strength indicator, as well as the RSRP into account and calculates for us the RSRQ number. So, and you can see that the signal to interference and noise only improved by 0.2 of a dB. So what it's telling me is that we degraded the RSRQ due to a lot of interruptions, a lot to on-air bit hits, if you want to call it that. And then if you watched my um, Datacoms 101, how retransmission kills a data stream. We're probably killing the data stream to a certain extent uh, and, and partly with a lot of retransmissions. I spoke to you previously about quadrature amplitude modulation or QAM. Now, QAM, if we look at a vector diagram, this is, of course, zero degrees, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees. So on a vector diagram, let's say at 33 degrees and 60 degrees, we modulate the amplitude, and that represents, let's say, zero, zero, and that will represent zero one this will represent one zero and that will represent one one so as we go around the vector diagram you'll see that we're modulating the signal and there's four bits per quadrature four by four this is a 16 bit quadrature amplitude modulated signal now, if you look at that in the time domain, these are quadratures, and that's 30 degrees, that's 60 degrees, there's 
zero zero there's zero one and this might be one zero and then over there we've got one one four bits in a quadrature now i've drawn lines around these because the demodulator will have a threshold around each one of these amplitude modulated signals which means that it has to fall within that threshold to be recognized as being modulated at that phase and at that amplitude quadrature quadrature amplitude modulation now what we've seen before is that noise gets modulated on top of the carrier like like this now the effect that it has is that the signal could have imperfections or data heat sitting around the actual modulation or shall rather say the modulation uncertainty due to the noise modulated could vary widely so if you were to look at it like that i may modulate and the center of the threshold might be over there but due to the noise modulation the uncertainty of where it could be is modulated by the noise that's part of the carrier so it could sit anywhere around any of these spots but as long as it falls within the threshold it will still be recognized in this case as one zero now you can see this is only 16 bit as soon as we start modulating more and remember in modern communications we are now getting to 2048 for instance bit quam I was going to use 2048, but let's use 4096 uh, QAM. And believe it or not, there are already systems that are using 4096 QAM. But just think of that. 4096 divide 4 is 1024. The square of 1024 is 32, which means that over here we've got 32 bits represented in in the amplitude and 32 bits represented in the phase so looking at the vector diagram it actually divides the quadrature into 32 different angular modulation uh, slots each each one with its own amplitude of 32 different positions. Now, each one of these positions will have a threshold, and you can see if there's 32 that's represented in terms of amplitude, the threshold around each one of those modulation spots is very, very small. So as you can see, the, the modulated noise will create an uncertainty of that uh, bit that that lies possibly outside of the threshold so as what the modulation systems guys did was to say right if we are modulating at 1024 per quadrature let's drop the modulation to something like 16 uh, eventually and and it actually drops it drops it down to down to eventually to 512 to 64 all the way to 16 16 probably being the the, the least and you'll see that because i'm now only representing four bits per quadrature the actual threshold becomes a lot larger and I can tolerate a lot more noise. So that is really what, what happens. 
obviously as it steps back in modulation, which it done so necessitated by the fact that there's a lot of noise impacting on the threshold, so to speak, you start losing capacity and the capacity in either the, in our case, the uplink drops dramatically. You can see if it, if it, if we were using something like in the LTE world, a 64 uh, bit quam, and we have to drop down to 16, you, you can see that, that, is, that we have a dramatic drop in the ability to carry bits on the carrier wave. Just to put back in perspective, the receiver being in the noise, so to speak, being deaf is not listening or not getting the acknowledgements and then suddenly getting retransmissions that's impacting the uplink stream. So now we're going to install the E.2. Remember the E.2 is a directional antenna. The electromagnetic energy is focused in the direction of our base station. And in doing so, we exclude the interference and noise from all of the surrounding areas, focusing our energy towards the uh, base station 370 meters up the road from here. But remember, across the hill and still challenging. So let's see how well the E.2 does.